guys, welcome back to my channel. It is the first day of May, it is beautiful and sunny outside. Let's talk about some books. Specifically, let's talk about the eight books that I managed to read in April. I finally broke my streak of only reading five books a month like I did in January, February, and March, so I'm very happy about that. Let's just go over what I did. The first books that I wanna talk about is gonna be three in a series because I continued to read the Percy Jackson and the Olympians and then Heroes of Olympus series. I'm just gonna have to show you pictures of all of these because I got them out of the library and have since had to return them. So I got through The Battle of the Labyrinth by Rick Riordan and then I got through, what was that one called? The Last Olympian, I think, is book five. It's the final book of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. And then I got through book one of the Heroes of Olympus follow-up series, which is called The Lost Hero. So I have been talking in my previous videos about how I really did not like the first book of the Percy Jackson series, the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, because it was really inconsistent, the characterization was terrible, the pacing was all over the place, you know, various things, and then they were steadily getting better. And then book four, Battle of the Labyrinth, was really good. I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed it a lot. It was sort of sliding into taking itself much more seriously, like there was a serious battle at the end of it, and you know, it had been sort of sliding into a more like heavy narrative. And then The Lost Olympian sort of like took that way further than I expected to. Like there was a serious shift in tone between books four and five. Like it had been progressing in that direction, but it just takes a big step into book five where suddenly like the stakes are way higher. I believe it way more. Like it's just gotten a lot more serious and suddenly I'm emotionally compromised by a book that's written for 12 year olds. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I really enjoyed this series and I thought that it ended in a way that was really satisfying. At least this first, um, you know, series of five books did. Of course, I immediately went and picked up the first book in the Heroes of Olympus series, which was a bit of a setback, I'm gonna be honest, because it is the first in a new series, so in a lot of ways it sort of reset some of the things that we developed since the first book, and it doesn't it doesn't have some of the problems of the first book, it is way better written, it has way better pacing, and the stakes make a lot more sense, but it does have a little bit of that problem that the first book had where they kept like delaying reveals of information that were so obvious. Like in the first book they keep delaying, in the very first book, they keep delaying the reveal that Percy Jackson's father is Poseidon. I'm like, this is a kid that has very obvious water powers, who else could his father be? And there's a sort of similar problem in the uh, first book of the second series, which is The Lost Hero, which is we meet a kid named Jason who is amnesiac and is just like so clearly the god of Jupiter and not Zeus, like he's so clearly from the Roman side. I don't know how they missed that. They spend like the entire book dancing around it. I'm like, this is not a hard question. He speaks Latin. He keeps referring to things by their Roman names. What, what else do you need to make that more obvious? But whatever, it was kind of a minor thing and I was also sort of used to Rick Riordan pulling this kind of nonsense from the first book. So we are introduced to a sort of whole new cast of characters in The Lost Hero, which are Jason and um, Leo and Piper. I really liked all of them. I think I like Jason and Piper a little bit more because Leo kept trying to be funny and his jokes didn't quite land, which is probably partly because this book series was written for 12 year olds, but that's fine. I like what they've developed so far in the story, except the whole amnesia thing kind of drives me crazy, but that's okay. And I am definitely gonna keep reading the series because I'm invested now. That's, that's just how it's gonna go. So the next two that I have to talk about are graphic novels. The first one I mentioned in my April haul, which is Bodywork, A Rivers of London tie-in. This is by Ben Aronovich and has art by Cartmel, Sullivan, and Guerrero. It is just a sort of fun little in-between story um, while we wait for The Hanging Tree, which is the next full installment of the Rivers of London novel series. I believe it is coming out in August in the United States. I think I thought that it was June, but that's the UK release date. Oh well. It has some of my favorite side characters like Sarah Galeed and uh, Major, I don't remember her first name, Major Stephanopoulos, um, whatever her first name is. And I thought that the art was pretty good. This is um, Peter and Sarah Galeed 
going to uh, interrogate suspects, I believe. Anyway, so it was a fun cast of characters and a fun little story. The next one I actually only picked up because I kind of joined a book club. It is Princess Leia by Mark Wade, I believe, or something Wade. So this is another sort of tie-in in between major installments. This takes place in between two of the original trilogy movies. It is about Leia sort of going around trying to gather the remnants of her people after her planet is destroyed. I am not a huge Star Wars fan. Like I watched the original trilogy when I was a kid growing up. I watched the prequel trilogy in theaters when I was in about middle school, I think is how old I was when those came out. And then I watched The Force Awakens um, when it came out this past December. So like I've seen all the movies, but I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. I liked this. I don't have that really strong feelings about it one way or the other. I thought it was just sort of a cute little story. The art was nice. It had a sort of soft quality to it that I liked and the story was decent and there was a character named Evan or Even or something like that that I thought was kind of awesome. She's this sort of sarcastic pilot who is obviously gonna be my favorite character. What a surprise. So if you are a big Star Wars fan this might be worth checking out. I am not really qualified to talk about Star Wars that much so we're gonna move on. So next on the list is an audiobook that I mentioned in my TBR list for my March wrap-up. It is the Welcome to Night Vale novel by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner. I really liked this book. I thought that it was fun. If you're a fan of the podcast then you kind of know what to expect going in because it does have that very similar sense of humor that the podcast does. It has a lot of little in-jokes to the podcast. It references some events from the podcast that actually go fairly into the timeline, like it's past the part where Dana is um, elected mayor of Night Vale, so it's fairly deep into it. The plot of the novel focuses on sort of two main characters, Jackie Fierro, I think is her last name, who is a 19 year old who runs the pawn shop in Night Vale and apparently has run the pawn shop forever and she is still 19. And the other main character is Diane Creighton who is a member of the PTA and she has a teenage son named Josh. This book is, is a little weird. I think that it works better as an audiobook. I don't know that I would have enjoyed it if I'd been reading it as like a full text novel because it is narrated by Cecil Palmer who is the voice- no narrated by Cecil Baldwin, who is the voice of Cecil Palmer on the show. And so listening to him narrate it is sort of similar to like a long form podcast episode. The basic premise is that the man with the tan jacket and the deerskin suitcase comes into Jackie's pawn shop and gives her a piece of paper that says King City on it. And as soon as he does this, she is unable to put the piece of paper down. Meanwhile, Diane is having problems with her teenage son, Josh, who is wanting to find out about his father who left when he was a baby, he was basically abandoned them, and Diane is having to deal with the fact that her ex has recently showed up back in town, and Josh doesn't know anything about him, and she doesn't really want to talk about it because she doesn't really like talking about her ex. I've kind of stopped listening to the Welcome to Night Vale podcast because I felt like I'd kind of gotten used to its whole thing, and it just wasn't really surprising and delighting me the way that it used to. I think that the book has some things that I thought were really clever and really well done. Done. Um, I didn't think that it was phenomenal. One of the things that I thought was well done in a way that was kind of excruciating was Diane's relationship with her son Josh. It is like excruciatingly accurate to what being a teenager is like and also it had some moments about how you can be a really good mom and a really loving and caring mom and still not always say the right thing or do the right thing and sometimes you can keep things from your kids because you think that you're protecting them but you know they really need to figure these things out on their own. I thought that it had some really good moments like that and of course it has its Nightville weirdness. Um, the plot is a little odd. I'm not sure what else I expected given that it's Welcome to Night Vale, but you know, it's gonna work for some people and not others. I definitely recommend the audiobook if that is an option for you, particularly since it is narrated by the same guy as the podcast. It just sort of ties it all together more. Okay, so the next book on the list is again one I talked about in my April haul. This is Ask a Queer Chick, A Guide to Sex, Love, and Life for Girls Who Did Girls by Lindsay King Miller. I mentioned in my last video I do identify as queer. So Lindsay King Miller ran or possibly still runs a column called Ask a Queer Chick on a site called The Hairpin, which is one that I have visited before. I haven't really specifically read her column, but I've liked the content that they put out. I like the sort of sensibility that they have on that site, so I decided to give it a shot, particularly because it's a book that, you know, 
might be kind of useful for me, and also is one that hasn't really existed before, and so I thought that it would be fun to give it a try, particularly since she was, you know, young and inclusive in her queer ideas, and generally might just be talking about some stuff that I thought was useful. I don't know that this book really, like, told me a lot of stuff that I didn't already know, but it was nice to just have some things that I had kind of figured out but not really vocalized, to just have them like vocalized and validated in a way that was smart and funny and inclusive. Um, Lindsay King Miller is bi, like me, she is 27, like me, so we were in very sort of similar points of our lives and so I didn't really feel like she was telling me anything groundbreaking, but it was still nice to hear some of my own thoughts mirrored on the page. Since she is bi, there's no biphobia in this book, she's very trans-inclusive, she gives advice on things like coming out, on how to deal with discrimination, as well as just like how to meet queer people. So I thought it was fun. If that is a thing that you think that you might enjoy or, you know, find use from, then, you know, maybe go check it out. The last book that I wanted to talk about is another audiobook. It is called H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. This I used for the Pop Sugar Reading category of an autobiography, and Helen MacDonald is a woman who was working at Cambridge as a history professor. She had a long-standing history of interest and involvement in falconry. She had, you know, reared and flown many different kinds of falcons, and when her father died very suddenly of a heart attack, she decided to train a goshawk, which are some of the, like, most notoriously difficult birds to train. She doesn't specifically say this, but you sort of get the implication that she really just, like, needs something to like dive into and focus on to sort of take her away from the grief of losing her father. I kind of loved this book actually. It was narrated by Helen MacDonald and she has an absolutely lovely Cambridge accent and it was this sort of odd mix because first of all I love Birds of Prey. I went through a period in like middle school where I was completely obsessed with Birds of Prey so it plays into my interest for that reason and it plays into my interest because you know she's not a literature professor, but she is in the humanities, you know, she's a history professor, and she also spends a lot of time talking about T.H. White, who is the guy that wrote Once and Future King. I've never read Once and Future King, but I still just found that whole concept really interesting, because T.H. Uh, White wrote a book called The Goshawk before he wrote The Once and Future King, and it is about his own experiences training a goshawk and how he was doing it really badly, like disastrously badly. And so the book is this odd mix. It's a mix of like history and nature writing and personal autobiography and talking about hawks, which are some of my favorite things. It's sort of an odd book to categorize in that way. Like, yes, it's an autobiography, but it has so many other threads to it that I really enjoyed, like, all of it. I thought that the whole book was really well woven together. You know, the, her grief over losing her father comes through really strongly, but she doesn't just spend the book talking about her dad. She takes those emotions about her dad and, you know, ties them into all these other bigger themes. The relationship that she ends up having with her goshawk is also really fascinating because she sort of ends up adopting the mindset of the hawk in order to sort of get out of herself because she doesn't really want to be in her own headspace and she doesn't really want to feel human. And I think because of that care and attention that she pays to her hawk, her hawk is really calm around her, generally speaking, and her like falconry friends, they are like amazed at how calm this hawk is. And she like plays with her goshawk, which like apparently is not a thing that goshawks are really known to do. And she also goes into the history of falconry, how it was such a class thing, you know, it was a thing for noblemen and specifically noble men, you know, women weren't really allowed to do this for a very long time. And she really gets into that and I thought that that was really cool too. You know, she's not just talking about her experience with the hawk, she's talking about falconry as a thing that's existed for centuries. So I thought that the book was really wonderful and if you enjoy audiobooks, I really enjoyed her reading of it. So that was everything that I read in April. I want to really quickly go over a few things that I'm planning on reading in May, which I can't believe it's already May. It's sort of this pile right over here. <laughs> this is this is kind of what we're doing. So the first and most exciting is The Raven King by Maggie Stiefvater. I finally have it. I'm so happy. I was kind of hoping to read it this past week actually, but I just did not get a chance because I know I'm going to need to set aside like a fairly large chunk of time to like read and digest this book. But I was just really busy this past week, so I really just didn't have the kind of time to devote to this book that this book requires. So haven't gotten to it yet, but definitely going to get to it very soon. The next one was in my April haul. It 
is No Love Allowed by Kate Evangelista. I'm about halfway through it. I probably will be finishing it soon. Just again, I had kind of a busy week. I didn't have time to finish it. I'm enjoying it, um, but I will talk about it more when I actually finish it. Obviously, I am continuing my read of the Percy Jackson series. So next on the list is The Son of Neptune. I also have The Mark of Athena here, which since it is a library book, I'll have to finish it soon. So books two and three of the Heroes of Olympus. And then for a book that a family member recommended you on the Pop Sugar Reading Challenge, I have decided to read Lucky Jim by Kingsley Amos. My mother recommended this to me. She said that it was really funny, but that's honestly the only thing that I know about this book. So I just very quickly glanced over the synopsis of this one. It is set in post-World War II England in a society that is sort of dealing with its class structure and the breakdown of its class structure. Apparently it's really funny, so I'm hoping it's going to be sort of PG Woodhouse-ian, but even if it's not quite that level of funny, I think I'll still like it. I have voluntarily read Charles Dickens, so you know, this should be no problem. But that is going to be it for this video. Um, let me know in the comments if you've read any of the books I've mentioned, and I will see you guys very soon with another video. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye!